So, if you're with us now, Colossians chapter 3, we're going to go ahead and read a, a interesting passage uh, for the day, and I decided to separate this passage out from where we've been studying with the household code that we looked at last week, because it's an area of... Um, It's an area of study that we don't really understand what's going on very well in the ancient context, so learning how to apply it in the modern context can be kind of challenging. Um, There are some similarities when we talk about masters and slaves between the ancient and modern context, but there's also a lot of differences. Paul is writing here, and just to kind of recap you of where we're at, at, in Colossians chapter 3, he basically says, well, he says in the beginning part of chapter 3, after spending all of this time saying, here's who you are in Christ, he says, so if you've been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above where the Messiah is, seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with the Messiah in God, and when the Messiah who is your life is revealed, you will also be revealed with him in glory. He's going from the first couple chapters of saying, here's what God has done to redeem you and bring him to himself through Jesus, and now here is how he wants us as his disciples, as his followers, to walk and to live as a result of what he has done. What I want you to see, and I try to remind you and remind us of this all the time, Who we are, our identity always determines what we do. It never goes the other way. We don't do something in order to become something. We are something in Christ, therefore we are called to walk in a certain way. And the reason why behavior is determined by identity is because it's in behavior that we're going to find that we are nothing apart from the power of Christ in us. We're nothing. We cannot walk in the way God wants us to without his help. Which is why it says, when Christ who is your life is revealed. Jesus intended for us to experience him as Lord and as Savior and as life. So we're going to be looking this morning at the second half of the household code. Uh, We said, put all these things to death, verse 5. Verse 12 says, therefore God's chosen ones, holy and loved, put on, and he lists a whole bunch of things there of the things of the Spirit with which we are to put on. And then he comes down to verse 17, which is a great summary verse. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to to God the Father through him. So everything you do, and then he goes, wives, be submissive to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Colossians and Ephesians have mirroring passages here. He goes, kids, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then he says, fathers, don't exasperate your children. And now we come to today's passage, which is part of this household code, how the people would have heard, how do we apply Christ to our walk today in the context in which God has placed us? So uh, I invite you to rise and spirit or in body for the reading of the scriptures. Colossians chapter 3 says this, verse 22, slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Masters, supply your slaves with what is right and fair, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Pray with me, please. Our Father and our King, help us to make sense of these words um, for our world and for our context and for our life today. Remind us, teach us what it means that you are Lord of our life, whether we are whatever place we are at in our life, God. We submit to you as Lord. We submit to you as King. Thank you for your presence here among us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. All right. So this idea of lordship 
is really, really important in the scriptures. Um, a couple of things about the word Lord, so that we understand what we're talking about when we say this word kurios. Um, probably one of the central verses in uh, the book of Colossians is Colossians chapter 2, in verse 6, where it says, So then, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. What I want you to see is that, number one, we receive Christ Jesus as Lord. We, it's not something we can earn. It's something that we have to receive. The, God, the gift of God's grace is nothing that we could manufacture. It's nothing that we could uh, position ourselves to, to have power over. And yet it is offered to each person. And he says, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, it reminds me of that verse in Romans chapter 10 where it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He's saying here, if you have taken on this new identity in Christ, you're taking him on as Lord. What does it mean to take him on as Lord of our life? The word Lord here in Colossians 2 and in Colossians 3, where we'll look today, is the word kurios. In Greek, this word um, is a phenomenal word. It means owner. It means Lord or capital L, Lord. I'll explain that in a minute. It means master. It means one who commands by virtue of possession. All right? By virtue of possession. So this could be used, in context tells you how it's being used, it could be used to describe a master over a slave. It could be used to describe a revered person within the community. Um, it could be used just as a term of respect. Um, the word kurios is the Greek word. The word adon or adonai is the Hebrew word for this. It can be used in the same way. It'd be like, hey, sir. Um, actually, when we were learning Greek, the, the small definition that we were given uh, or the, the words that we would translate for adonai or for kurios was lord, lord, master, or sir. But it has this idea in special context, in many contexts, of one who commands by virtue of possession. This idea of Lord. And last week we looked about how do we apply the Lordship of Christ to our families, to our marriage relationships if we're married, to our familiar relationships with our kids if we have kids. And, and he's going to talk about here a specific context of master Adon, or kurios, and slave. A context which Paul's audience knew well. But when we talk about masters and when we talk about slaves, we have to recognize that in our context, we look at that through a certain um, pair of lenses. We, we have a certain way of looking at it because of the nature of the history of our, um, of our country and even within our world today. I like... Um, how one writer describes it. Because while Paul is addressing how to apply Christ's life to the common household codes, this one writer helps us distinguish between then and now in this way. He says, American Christians are not comfortable with passages on slavery. Some think it is embarrassing that the apostles did not try to overturn the slave system. In our activist culture, it doesn't occur to people that while they were facing the need for a first generation of Christ's followers to reach a lost world, the economic reality of slavery wasn't their first priority. He says, the leaders of the Christian mov movement obviously recognized the danger in attempting to dislodge a system that was approaching 50% of Rome while 99% of the Roman world was still lost. What is he saying here? When the Bible talks about slavery, it generally doesn't go to decry the institution, but what it does do, and we'll look at this today, it goes to reset who human beings are made in the image of God. That's actually what Paul's going to do here. What, what Paul's going to do is he's not going to attack slavery, which comprised of 30 to 50% of the known Roman world at that time. He's going to go to say, if you're in that relationship, you need to look at people a different way. And he's going to go back to the beginning to reestablish what does it mean to be made in the image of God. Now, how do I know that? 
one of the things that we read in the course of our last several weeks of study is chapter 3, verse 11. He says there, he says, In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Paul recognizes that there are distinctions between people. And especially when it comes to distinctions that have to do with our race or the color of our skin or have to do with our ethnicity from where we came or distinctions between male and female that Ephesians talks about, there are distinctions here that God, that, that are important. Like men and women don't cease being men and women. They're, they're not rolled up into one and they're all the same thing. No, just like Jews and Gentiles were still distinctly Jews and Gentiles. What Paul is trying to address is how do we live as a body of Christ in a world that separates all these distinctions and says, you are this and you are this. And it actually calls us to a higher ideal where each person made in the image of God is given dignity and is given worth, and is given value simply because they were made in the image of God. Which is why when we read those verses, and we'll talk about them about slaves do this, and masters do this, he's not directly attacking the institution of slavery, but he is absolutely attacking how masters looked at their slaves. And he's definitely attacking how slaves looked at their masters, and that relationship they had with one another, setting them back on who they are made in the image of God. The church has not always dealt with the issue of slavery well. We cannot adequately deal with all the components of slavery and for our context, especially racial inequality within the constraints of our time this morning. But I just want to underscore this very truth to you. We must clearly state that every person, regardless of their race, their ethnicity, and their gender, are made in the image of God. Genesis 2 and 3 say this, that God made man and women in his image. He, he made them male and female. He created them. Each one of you, each one listening to my voice, each person that you go out to see during your lunchtime today or during your drive today is a person made in the image of God, a person for whom God loves and a person for whom Christ died. Every person. And we have to start there because these distinctions that we build in our culture and that were built back in their culture are many times not biblical approaches to what it means that we have the image of God stamped on our life. We are loved by God. Jesus Christ died to pay for the sins of the whole world. Um, Every person is offered the free gift of God's grace The offer of grace is universal in scope, but it is dependent upon response. And so our theology of humanity must include a proper understanding that each person is an image bearer and thus should be treated that way. Regardless of the family relationship, regardless of the relationship at work or the relationship at school, each person is valued by God in that way. And so as we think about that, We hear these words, slaves, obey your masters in everything, and they should come a little bit as a shock because he's talking to a group of people who in the ancient context were not their own. They weren't their own. They were possessed by someone else. Now, it's interesting. I want to give you a little bit of background on this idea of slavery in the ancient period so that we can contrast it to to what many of us know here today. Um, One of the things that, that the philosopher Aristotle said was this about slavery. He said, first, that anybody who by his nature, he's describing a slave, is not his own man, but another's, is by his nature a slave. In other words, so he's saying a slave is anyone who is not his own man. He says, secondly, that anyone who, being a man, is an article of property is another's man. And thirdly, that an article of property is an instrument intended for the purpose of action inseparable from its possessor. So when Aristotle's talking about this idea of slavery, he's understanding that for his people and his point in time, it means that you were possessed or you were owned by someone else. You were not your own. 
In fact, um, many slaves would hold something like this. Uh, this is from the 4th or 5th century AD, and the inscription here on this slave collar that a slave would have around their neck says, hold me lest I flee and return to my master. That should shock us. That should grieve us. Because what we see then and what we have seen in slavery, both in our modern time in the past several years, is this very notion that slavery captures people and it possesses them. And many times it treats them as less than human. And that is wrong. And that breaks the heart of God. And as the people of God, we should be people who say, no, you are made in the image of God and I honor you because of that regardless of your race or your gender or your ethnicity. However, when we look at, or maybe not however, when we look at the context of slavery in the ancient world, there are some similarities, but there's a lot of differences to how slavery was experienced back then and how it's been experienced in our context today. In the first century of Rome, slavery was integral to the Roman way of life. Integral. I've mentioned that 30 to 50% of the people at this time were enslaved. I, I want you to just look around you and I want you to count 10 people, all right? Count 10 people who are sitting around you, just silently. You don't have to count out loud, all right? 10 people. Just take the number four because it's the median number there. Four of those people in the ancient period, you'd be gathered in a house church. Four of those people would have been slaves on average. You're gathering to worship. And we gather today largely as a free people. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ throughout, the world, throughout our world do not have the same experience um, that we have here. But we largely gather today as free people. But imagine you're in the first century. You're in a house church in Colossae. You're in a house church in Hierapolis. Or you're in Corinth. Or you're in um, Athens. Or you're in Rome. And four out of ten in your church work as slaves. That's the people that Paul is writing to. And many of the others then would be masters. Not always. Sometimes you'd have free men who were self-sufficient or who were generally poor. But you have this as a very present reality in first century Rome. Um, one scholar, um, this is David Williams in his book on Paul's metaphors. He says, two to five million slaves were in Italy by the end of the first century BCE. He says, slavery was a fact of life everywhere and in every facet of employment. He says, slaves could be found doing jobs that free people would do, not just menial tasks. He talks about there's three different conditions that slaves could find themselves in. There were city conditions, which were generally much more favorable to those who were enslaved. Um, there were agricultural conditions, which were much harsher for those who were enslaved because of the type of work. There's also um, being a slave in the mines, which was a cruel existence that would end one's life quickly because of the difficulty of the work. He says, slaves were classed as chattels, not persons. They could be bought, sold, and punished at the will of the master. And if a slave had a tyrannical master, they had only a few options. One option was that they could flee and they would be punished if they were caught. A, a second option would be to seek sanctuary. If they had a cruel master, they could, they could ask for sanctuary. But it was always a coin flip about how that one would turn out, given all the players involved. And so in Roman society, slaves had to be returned if found away from their master. But the way people became slaves varied. Um, one of the most common ways people became slaves was the Roman army would go in and conquer an area. And the, those who were conquered then became the slaves of the Romans. Um, you, if you engaged in things like piracy or robbery or kidnapping, many times you would become a slave as a result of those actions. Um, you could become a slave uh, through being... Um, like what would happen is if you were uh, an unwanted child, they would leave unto unwanted children sometimes near the trash dumps and the dumps and the heaps. Those kids would sometimes be picked up by people, taken into their home, and made their slaves. In Roman society, um, you could find people who uh, were criminals, and then they would be enslaved. You would also find that people would find themselves self-enslaved 
Um, in other words, they would be a freeborn person, but they would go into a debt that they couldn't pay. And so they would go to someone and say, will you pay for this debt and I will become your slave? And so that's called a bond servant. Um, they would enter into slavery sometimes that way. The other way that you could become a slave is if you were a child born into slavery. It was everywhere. It was horrible. One of the differences, though, between slavery in their time and slavery that we might have experienced in the history of our country is that back then, slavery was not associated with ethnicity in any way. It didn't matter whether you were of a certain color skin or whether you were from a certain country in the world. Um, it was an equal opportunity, um, bad opportunity. <laughs> um, also, in the Roman world, slavery was rarely permanent. All right? Slavery was rarely permanent. In other words, there were some people like criminals and people who were conquered that may end up in some really bad forms of slavery, but many people were able to somehow, um, through a process called manumission, buy their freedom. And they could buy their freedom from their master, and they could become citizens sometime again. Sometimes again, um, sometimes they couldn't become citizens, but they could become free. Um, slavery also acted as a bankruptcy. I, I mentioned selling oneself to one's creditors. And the other thing that's kind of hard, I think, for, at least for me to understand, is sometimes if you were a slave to a master, you actually could have a better life than someone who was poor but free. Right? I, I mentioned earlier that the same jobs were occupied by both slave and freemen. So you might be a, a cook within a master's house, and you're a slave to that master, but your family could eat. <laughs> and the family across town were barely struggling by to eke out an existence. I, I, I can't remember the source for this, but I remember reading one time um, that in the ancient period, it took four people working to feed five people. So imagine you have a household of five. It required four of you to work in order to feed your whole family. We are so amazingly blessed in the context and culture in which we live. We're so blessed. Um, I've had the opportunity to travel to various countries throughout the world and to see people scrape by on meager existences. And it's amazing to me, especially to see um, the joy that they have in their hearts and in their faces, especially when they know Jesus, that, that even the smallest things that, given, that God gives to them in life, they're so incredibly great, grateful for. When Paul is writing this, he's writing to people who are slave and free. He's writing to people who are male and female. He's writing to people who are rich and who are poor. He's writing to people who are Jew and Gentile. And he levels them all and he says, in Christ, in Christ, you are loved, you're accepted, you're chosen, you're redeemed, you're made righteous. In Christ, oh, you have life. In Christ, you have a hope, not just for this world, but for the world to come. But he enters into speaking about this with slaves, and he's going to say these words in verse 22. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. This word here for obey, it means to listen to. It, it means to hear, to listen, to obey. It's the word that is used when it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. He says, slaves, I want you to live in such a way that you obey. And notice what he says, your human masters in everything. It's interesting that Paul would write that. This is literally translated, you could probably say your fleshly masters or your masters in the body or masters in the flesh. And the reason he specifies this is because at the end of the verse, he says, don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Twice this word kurios for Lord is used in this, in this verse, where it says, you're human kurios, slaves obey them, but you're also, even more importantly, to work for your real kurios. What Paul ends up doing is, is, is not going after the institution. He ends up going after the institution by going after who people are made in the image of God. 
and setting a Genesis framework for who these people were. Imagine yourself hearing these words. In fact, I'm not sure how much we realize how countercultural this statement is to Paul's original hearers. He is telling these believers whose lives for all intents and purposes were owned by other people, however they got there, that they That they, even though they didn't have rights to citizenship, they couldn't enter into agreements, they couldn't compose wills, they couldn't conduct independent business. He's writing to people uh, whose efforts, whose all of their efforts were to profit their earthly masters. He says, I want you to obey them. Imagine if you had a really harsh master who said, I want you to do this. And God's saying, obey them. Hear them. Listen to them. Do what they say. Why would Paul make such a statement? It's kind of like what he says. I'm not drawing a a direct parallel here. Preface this. It's kind of like what he says with kids. Kids, obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. He makes a similar argument here. He says, you are to fear God. You're to work for your real kurios who is in heaven. And the way that you'll do that, the way that you'll be the hands and feet of your kurios in heaven is by being the best servant of your kurios in the flesh or your kurios on this earth. Obey them in everything. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly. He's saying that they shouldn't concern themselves with looking good when their master enters the house. Like, oh no, quick, hurry, he's coming. He's saying they shouldn't take that extra long break that they're not allowed to while they're clocked in. He's saying, I want you in everything you do to show your love for me by how passionately you work for your human master. Why? Why? Because it's through that consistent example of Christ living through that slave that maybe, perhaps, the softness of someone's heart who is a master would go, why does he or she act in a different way than all the other people who serve me? He says in verse 23, whatever you do, Do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men. He's reorienting the mindset of a slave. Oh, I have to go and I have to do that because my master said that. He's saying, no, I want you with your whole heart, with your whole attitude, with your whole um, strength that you have in the Lord. I want you to enter into that menial task. Maybe it's washing a floor. Maybe it's peeling some sort of vegetable. Maybe it is emptying out the latrine. Maybe it's preparing food for a group. Whatever they do, he wants them to have their hearts and their minds directed that they do that not just for their earthly master. They do it even more for their master who is in heaven. They they should work heartily because their first Their first aim is to bring glory to their true kurios, the Messiah Jesus. And verse 24 here, he says, Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. This idea of inheritance is something that slaves knew of, but they couldn't participate in. Um, This is an ancient will back from the first century time, I believe is the time it comes from. If you were a slave, you did not receive an inheritance from your mom or your dad. You couldn't enter into such an agreement. You would have to have your master do that on your behalf. And then, and even then, it's not guaranteed that whatever the will says will come back to you. So if you were slaves, you had no notion that you would actually receive an inheritance in this earth. But Paul says, knowing that you receive, you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. He says, you serve the Lord Christ. In other words, he wants them to remember they don't live for this world only. As we studied in 1 Corinthians 15 a couple weeks ago, um, Paul says there, he says, if our hope is for this life only, we are people who should be most pitied. (laughs) 
We are people who should be most pitied. Why? Because this world is not it. This is but a glimmer of what one day God will bring to a whole newness. And there will be no more crying or grief or tears or pain because the whole order of things has passed away and God makes everything new and he gives us the fullness of an inheritance regardless of the state in which we find ourselves. So the slave here is hearing, I will receive an inheritance from the Lord. And so I work not to earn it, but because he is my kurios. He says, you serve the kurios. Kurios Christos, I think is the Greek there. But then he comes to this transition verse, which says, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. This idea of favoritism is something in the scriptures that God does not bless. <laughs> he does not like favoritism. Uh, if you want to look it up later, uh, you can look up Romans chapter 2, verse 11, or James chapter 2, verse 1, um, where God is essentially going to say, I play no favorites. I look at what's right, and I look at what's wrong. And here he says, the wrongdoer will be paid back for, ever, for whatever wrong he has done. He doesn't say the slave will be paid back. He doesn't say the master will be paid back. He says the wrongdoer. So what God is calling his people to is do what's right. Walk in the power of the spirit to do what is right. Um, Titus, the letter to Titus will say multiple times in the third chapter, do what is good. And good is always defined according to what God says is good. So God shows no favoritism. He levels the playing field. He is against wrongdoing regardless of anyone who is doing it. Race, gender, ethnicity are secondary to faithfully walking after God. So we have all these verses about um, the commands that Paul gives slaves within the household of the Roman society. Then he says, don't do what's wrong. Don't be partial. And then he comes to the word for masters. And he says, masters, supply your slaves with what is right and fair, since you know that you too have a kurios in heaven. He's wanting to not only reframe how the slaves would integrate within their within their context, he also wants to give a word to the masters. Now imagine that you are a master and you have control because to be a curios over a household, to be um, a pater familia, we talked about that a little bit last week, the head of the household who has absolute authority over everything within their grasp, to be told by Paul, masters, Oh, that's right. I am the master. I have authority over everyone within my sphere. He says, masters, don't forget, you have a kurios. So he's raising those who are servants or slaves up, and he's taking masters who in the society had a power, and he's bringing them down, and he's essentially leveling this playing field, saying, remember, all of you serve a new kurios if you're in Christ. And you are called to live in such a way that the life of Christ flows from you to those around you. So he says, supply your slaves, or the other way you could translate that is deal with your slaves. And, and that's an imperative there. Um, imperative for masters, but it's modified by two words. And these words describe the kind of environment that masters were called to provide for those under their authority. And the way it's modified are the words justice and fairness. Justice and fairness. Now, justice is being judicially approved by God. It's doing what God says is right. He says, masters, I want you to do what I say is right within the confines of scripture and within the confines of the words I have given to you to walk out of the life of Christ. Not only do I want you to do what is right, I want you to do what is fair. I want you to be proportional and I want you to give a quality of treatment to everyone underneath your care. I love the way that one writer describes this verse. He says, as the slave's motivation is changed by the gospel, so is the master's. It says, the slave owner must consider his behavior in light of the master in heaven. Justice and fairness, he says, exclude any kind of abuse or oppression. And if you are a master, that 
time and you had absolute authority over your house, abuse and oppression were two common ways that you would use to get people to fall into line. That you would get people to do what you wanted them to do because after all, you are the curios. But here, Paul says, remember, you have another curios and you are called to relate to the people within your authority in such a way that abuse and oppression are not a part of your solutions. You're to be just, you are to be fair in everything you do. Why? Because your life has been redeemed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your life has been changed because Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And you're called as a master to live in light of this amazing grace that you have experienced. You all know the song, Amazing Grace. You probably know the story behind it, how the writer who wrote the lyrics used to be a slave trader. And he comes to know, he comes to know the amazing grace of God through Jesus' death and resurrection. Absolutely changes his life. He goes on to influence a guy by the name of William Wilberforce, who many of you probably know, goes on to fight for abolition of slavery within especially the United Kingdom area. The thing that leads to the proper ordering of society is always the gospel. Because it's the gospel that brings hope. It's the gospel that brings life. And it's the gospel that sets in order everything else that comes after it. You can imagine, I mean, they didn't have it back then, but you can imagine them singing as slave and as free, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Four out of the 10 of their house church know what it's like to be slaves. The other ones probably have an idea of what it's like to be free. Some of them know what it's like to be the master. And yet they all come under the cross on level playing ground because they were all once dead in their sins, but they found life in Jesus. And now they're called to, in everything they do, to fear God because they now have a real master, a real kurios who is in heaven. Uh, sometime when you have a free moment, it won't take you long. Um, you can go to the book of Philemon. We're actually going to study Philemon next, next month in our Sunday school time um, together. Philemon is a story about a slave owner whom Paul is writing to, a master, a paterfamilias of a house. He, he, he's actually a member and probably one of the leaders of the church in Colossae. And Paul writes to him because while Paul is in chains and Colossians and Philemon are kind of tied together as part of Paul's prison letters. And while Paul is in chains, um, he meets a guy by the name of Onesimus. Uh, I think his name means useless or it means useful. I can't remember which one it is. You can look it up later. It's one of the two. <laughs> He, 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 he meets this guy named Onesimus while Paul is in chains. Now, Onesimus is a slave who has left the household um, of a guy by the name of Philemon. And he is run. He's gone off to, where, to, to, to wherever. He meets Paul. And Paul leads him to Christ. Can you imagine that? Like, like you're a runaway slave. And you meet the Apostle Paul, and Paul leads you to Christ. And then it so happens that Paul happens to know your master on earth. <laughs> and so Paul writes a letter using every bit of his credibility to implore Philemon to receive Onesimus back as his slave. In the Roman world, Onesimus could have been not treated well. And Paul implores this master, this curios in the flesh, to treat Onesimus. He implores Philemon to treat Onesimus as a brother. And in Philemon, verse 16, he says this, 
Paul says, no longer a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul implores Philemon, because of what Christ has done in your life, you know the grace that you've received, Philemon? You know how God has changed your heart? You know how God has stooped down in your sin and picked you up and raised you up? I want you to forgive. I want you to stoop down on behalf of Christ, and I want you to receive this one who is your slave. Who is your bondservant? And bondservant there probably suggests that um, Onesimus had, had maybe sold his life into the service of Philemon because he couldn't pay a bill or something like that. Um, but he wants to restore him so that as they now come to church together, as they come to church together, you have master and you have servant, but they're brothers. More important than their earthly positions, they're brothers in the Lord. And Paul urges him, receive this brother. Why? Because he's loved of God and because he's been found by the gospel. And we can think about this in a whole bunch of different ways in our context. We can think of all the racial ways in which we separate ourselves from people who are brothers and who are sisters. Friends, may it never be that our backgrounds, the color of our skin or the country from where we hail or our gender, whether we're male or we're female or our language would separate the body of Christ who is loved by God and who's brought together underneath the curios of heaven. May it never be as we go into our families that we would use power and we would use authority as a means by which to get what we want but rather we use the life of Christ in us to serve other people so that they may be lifted up and they may see how loved by God they are. May it never be that we forego truth for the sake of comfort. Truth matters, but there's a certain way in which we are called to engage truth in our world with gentleness and with respect. May it be that as we clearly articulate the gospel and we clearly articulate the truth of God within a world which is largely hostile to the things of God, that we wouldn't back down from the true message of the gospel because it's only the message of the gospel that actually brings life change. It's only the message of Jesus Christ that actually brings people to how God created them to be. But may it be through the winsome proclamation of the gospel in everything that comes with it that people would see, wow, these people are absolutely different. It'd be really easy in that context as a master to say, why are you acting in such a way? You've never served me in this way. And then the slave, if given an opportunity, goes, yeah, but I serve you because there's this guy I want to tell you about. And he's my curios. He, he's my curios in heaven. His name is Jesus. And, 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 and may, maybe it is too that, that masters in that ancient period begin to treat their slaves differently. And their slaves go, wait a second. You used to act a certain way. You used to yell. You used to scream. You used to punish. But now you're acting justly and fairly. And the master has the opportunity in that ancient context to say, it's because I may be your master on earth, but we all have a master in heaven. Can I introduce you to him? Now, the context of master and slave is not experienced by most of the people within the sounding of my voice. All right, by 99.99999 people within the sound of my voice. What does this look like in your relationship? And maybe we could ask it this way. Who's your curios? Who is your curios? Who is the person that you serve? Now you serve the Messiah, Jesus. He is your curios. He is the curios of all curios. But who are you called to serve here today? 
Maybe you are a factory worker and you clock in at 6 a.m. and you clock out at 3 p.m. What would God call you to do as you serve whatever business you work for in the area? He'd call you to be faithful. Like when you clock in, you're working. (laughs) That that you work with the joy of the Lord being your strength. That you say, yes, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, I'll be happy to do the thing that you've asked me to do. Not to receive any plaudits from the higher ups, but simply because you worship a God who says, serve me wholeheartedly. And as someone who is maybe in position of authority over you, or maybe another coworker says, why are you working so faithfully? Don't you know we can just kind of clock in, get our paycheck, get half our work done and whatever? You say, because I actually work for another master. I work for another curios. Maybe you are a business owner. Maybe you are a leader at a, a, a business in this area medical industry, uh, insurance industry, maybe you are in construction or you're in sales, and you have the ability to serve a whole host of people around you, maybe even people who work for you. And they say, why is it that boss is so different than all the other bosses? There's bosses who just want to get ahead to increase their bottom line, but they actually seem to care about me as a person and care that I am treated with justice and fairness. I know enough businesses in this area and in other areas um, that we're familiar with, just with friends and family and stuff, to know that there's good curiosities and bad curiosities. <laughs> There's people who exemplify what God calls them to live out. And there's people who don't. If you're a master, whether you're a worker this morning, maybe you're a student and God has placed you within the context of a school. You're to work wholeheartedly for the Lord and for your teacher. Why? Because you're a servant of your curios who is in heaven. And by the joyfulness of which you go about doing your algebra too, um, may your teacher know that you serve a curios who's in heaven, even if you still don't understand it like me, right? Um, we are each called to a specific context this week. Remember, you serve a curios who is in heaven. The only way that you and I can walk out what God asks us to do in being his hands and feet, though, is through a relationship with him. And it may be that you're here this morning and you're like, yeah, I've got a curiosity at work. I've got a curiosity over here. But maybe you've never had a relationship with your curiosity who is in heaven. God invites you to himself today because it's in him you find freedom. It's in him you find life. It's in him you find all that you need. Who's your curios? Who's your curios? Pray with me, please. Our Father and our King, we yield again our lives to you. You are our Lord. You are Master. You are the one who possesses us. And that is of good news to us today because without you, we would be lost and without hope. Without you, we'd be stuck on our own and left to a life of bondage to slavery and bondage to sin. And yet, God, you have set us free through your death and resurrection. And for that, we just thank you. Cause us to be thankful, God, of the work that you have begun in us, knowing that is a work that you are going to continue in us for your glory. And God, as we enter into a world that is very bent on power and authority structures, would you teach us what it means to serve? Number one, serve you. Number two, serve those around us so that they may see that we serve a curios who is in heaven. And Lord, even when that faithful service to you is not appreciated by those around us, would you remind us? that we don't serve for their applause and we don't serve for credit 
We serve because we want to do what's right and what is good and what is just in your sight. We define good by you today, God, because you are good. We thank you, Lord, for meeting us in all that we need today. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.